Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Lord, we do want to bring before you Barbie this morning. We pray, Lord, that you would be merciful to her. We know that she had longed to be with us this morning and to worship with us, and yet in your providence you have kept her from that. And now she heads to hospital this morning because of this fall that she's had. We do pray that you would be merciful to her, Lord. You have your purposes with all that happens in our life. And so we pray that you would be near to her at this time. We pray for others that are currently on hospital mission, like Charles and um, Chantal. We pray, Lord, that they would be a wonderful witness, even of you, in those places. I pray, Lord, as they meet different people that are suffering and going through difficulty, um, that they would be a blessing to those around them, even in the hospital rooms, that you would shine brightly your gospel there. Remind us, O Lord, that we are on mission with you, that you are doing a work even in our day. We pray for David Barnhouse and the work up in north of Zambia. We do pray that these vehicles would be able to register in time, that they would be able to fulfill the intended purpose of carrying folk that are on short-term mission. We pray, Lord, that your gospel would shine very brightly in this world, that you will use things like cholera outbreaks at Agataya and on the islands that the Larus are ministering at, and that you would use that for your glory, that you would give much um, unction and much energy to the Larue family as they seek to help the people around them. We pray that the gospel would go out mightily with them. We thank you so much for the privilege of coming to your word this morning once more, looking at a, a passage in the book of Exodus that has an impact on us and calls on us toward a fervent obedience towards the one who has blessed us in Christ with every heavenly blessing. We thank you this morning for your kindness to us, the fact that you are faithful even in our frailty, even in the times where we have not honored you as we ought, you have continued to be faithful and you have continued to give much grace. And that doesn't excuse our sin, Lord, not at all, but you have covered our sin in Christ. And we thank you for this. Thank you that we come and we assemble and we worship, not because of anything of who we are, but because of your goodness and because of what Christ has done for us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are coming again. We think of our world. We see uh, wars. We hear rumors of wars. We see the mounting of jihadists against Israel at a time like this. We see uh, the tensions between a place like Iran and Israel and various missiles that are being shot. We see the tensions in China and Taiwan. We see the tensions in Ukraine and Russia. We see the tensions in our world, O oh Lord. We see the removal of prime ministers and um, presidents and people in power. We see the way that, that there's so much happening, yet we know that you are in sovereign control. We know that we can put our trust even today in you and that we can continue even in our day being a church that is awake, a church that is working, a church that is found ready in herself for the return of her Lord. We pray that you would give us much boldness in this world that we live in, that we would be a shining light and that we would not be salt that loses its saltiness. Help us, dear Lord. We pray that you give us much strength and much courage in the world that we live in, and that you would also be pleased this morning to open up your truth, your word, to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I've entitled this message from Exodus 23, verse 20 to 33, The If-Then of Devotion the if-then of devotion. And part of what we see, and it actually ties up very well with tonight's sermon from Thessalonians, we see what God's perfect will is for Israel. But we also come to realize, because we get to, we have a, a vantage point that, that they didn't have right here. They've been before Mount Sinai, they've come through the Red Sea, God has destroyed um, the army of Egypt, He miraculously brings them out sets them free from slavery, and here they are before Mount Sinai, and they're busy receiving the law from God through Moses, his servant. And they didn't yet have the vantage point that you and I have. We can look back on Israel, and we can see the example that God uses them for in us. And he says to us today, if you hear my voice, do not harden your heart like they did. Because the very people that we read about 
in Exodus 23, or those that are receiving this command from God, did not actually do what God called them to do. And they have faced the consequence of that. They've received what we call the permissive will of God. They have the perfect will of God. They have the promises of God that says, if you do this, then this. But instead of obeying Him, because it is belief that drives that obedience, they instead don't obey Him. They go their own way. This whole generation perishes within the wilderness wanderings. You've only got Joshua and Caleb of that whole adult generation that goes into the land. And then when they're in the land, they have almost 400 years after Joshua the son of Nun, which we call the period of the judges, where they would disobey God, go after the idols of the nations that were still in the land, and God would punish His people, and then His people would turn and obey Him once they were punished, once they went through difficulty and hardship and brokenness. And then they would return to the Lord, and the Lord would give them a judge, and they would worship Him for a season, and then peace would return. And lo and behold, as peace would return and prosperity would return, they would go again after some other idol within the land. And they would face again the spiral of as soon as there was peace and prosperity, they turned their hearts from God. And they sat under their own tree, and they did what was right in their own eyes. They went their own way, which led to destruction, and God provided another judge. Eventually, it would end up with Samuel, the last judge of the people of Israel, who they would even reject, and Samuel would feel pretty heartbroken about that. He'd feel, they've rejected me. Look at what they've done. They've turned away from serving, or rather from serving God, but they've turned away from me as a judge. It must be a failure on my part. And God says, no, no, they didn't reject you. They rejected me. This was meant to be a theocracy. This was meant to be a nation under God. Well, they want a king, I'll give them a king. The king that they want, they take the man that was a head taller than all the rest of Israel. Not that there's a problem with being tall unless you go like. But they take the man a head taller. They choose for themselves one that was handsome, one that was tall. They take Saul, a man after their own heart as Israel. And look at how Saul leads their heart even away. Yet God miraculously does marvels through somebody like Saul. At one stage, only Saul and Jonathan had a sword out of all of Israel. And they win many battles against the Philistines. But eventually, Saul and his son Jonathan would be killed by the Philistines. And then David, a man after God's own heart, becomes king. But you see God's permissive will throughout the history of Israel. God had promised Abraham a land. They only ever had portions of the land. Not once in all of Israel's history have they actually had what we read about in Exodus 23, verse 20 to 33. Now the question to us even opening up this morning is, will you, dear one, trust the Lord? And will you follow the Lord? You see, because Israel, through its very broken history, has not. They've gone their own way. They have not trusted the Lord. Therefore, they have not obeyed the Lord. Therefore, they have been disobedient to Him. And they have reaped the consequences of that. Albeit that God has not given them the absolute consequence that they should have gotten. He has been very gracious. He has often withheld from them much of the destruction that they did deserve. He has often been faithful to them even when they have been frail towards God. The question is to you, dear one, will you hear His voice? Will you obey Him while you live today? This is the generation that He has called you to serve Him and for you to obey Him. Will you be His and will He be yours? Jesus said, if you love me, you will do what? Obey my commandments, John 8, 42. If Jesus is your Savior, and if He is your Lord, then, dear friend, you will follow Him. He has called you to be first His disciple, and then to disciple others. Follow Him, as He called His other disciples to follow Him. Matthew 4, 19, or Matthew 8, 22, with Levi even in Matthew 9, verse 9. Follow me. He leaves everything, and He follows the Lord. 
So this morning, as we study God's plan for His people Israel, we're going to be looking at this as He seeks for them to go in and possess the land which He had promised, and we're going to look at this in three sections, that you and I would be moved toward obedience towards our Lord, who promised to be with us as we are committed to Him. That's what He promised. There is something of an if-then kind of a devotion that you and I are called towards. If this, then this. If you will obey, then this. Now, let's look at this in these three sections. Firstly, we'll look at verse 20 to 23 of Exodus 23. And here we see the conditional annihilation. Conditional annihilation. We see that right at the last part of verse 23. says, and I will annihilate them. Speaking about the people that were in the land of Canaan. And he's saying, you're going to do this, but it's conditional in many respects. But look with me there from verse 20 to 23. Behold, I am going to send an angel before you. And we'll come to see that this is the angel of the Lord, the pre-incarnate Christ. He's the one that had gone before them already in the cloud and in the fire at night. He's the one that put himself between Egypt and Israel, the angel of the Lord, the one who had appeared to Moses in Exodus chapter 3. Yahweh from the bush calling out to him, Yahweh from heaven. So we see this pre-incarnate version of Christ, and we're going to see that more as we look at this. To keep you along the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Keep watch of yourselves before him and listen to his voice. Do not be rebellious towards him, for he will not pardon your transgression, since my name is in him. But if you truly listen to his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries, for my angel will go before you and bring you in to the land of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, and Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I will annihilate them. Do you see the conditional clause there in verse 22? But if you truly listen to his voice and do all that I speak, then, it's a if-then statement. The main idea of this section in verse 20 to 23 really is the fact that God sends an angel before them. You can see that right in the beginning part of verse 20. He says, I am going to send an angel before you. And then you see it in a summary format in verse 23. For my angel will go before you. God's saying, I'm going to be with you. I'm going with you in this. This is my plan. I have this sovereign plan. I have a sovereign will. And I will make it that my will gets done. But there's an if and then. What's God's promise? His promise is to keep you along the way. He says, I'll keep you along the way. It's going to be quite a way. You're going to go into the land. Now, this is why this is still the perfect will of God, because he had not yet seen their rebellion, and he had not yet said, you're going to be 40 years in the wilderness. As far as Israel knew at this point, they're at Sinai, they're receiving the law, they're about to go into the land. But you remember what happens. The 12 spies go in to the land to spy it out. Ten come back and say, no ways. We are like grasshoppers. They are like giants. There's no way we could go in. They're just going to squish us. And only Joshua and Caleb says, God said it. We believe it. If God said he's going to protect us, he will protect us. Let's go in. But instead, guess what they did? They listened to the democracy, which you could really paraphrase and say, it's a demo of your crazy, right? They listen to the many, and instead of listening to their God. And what, did, what transpired from that? Well, this whole generation that does not believe me will die in the wilderness. And only Joshua and Caleb, those ones who said, God said it, we believe it, went in. And you'll remember what happened with Caleb. Kind of reminds me of another older brother that I know of in our congregation. He says, no, no, give me the hill country. Give me the place where all the giants are. I'll go there. Caleb, at 80 years old, is like, I'm just as strong as what I was then. And God promised it. So give me the sword and give me the land. 
He, God promised, I will keep you along the way. That's part of what spurred on men like Joshua and Caleb in their faith. God said it. He said he'd be with us. And then it says, to bring you to the place which I have prepared. Give me the hill country because God said he's prepared it for us. You say, I'm a grasshopper. Well, if I'm a grasshopper, give me those giants. I'm going to bite with the teeth that I've been given. But there's precepts which then God gives to Israel. You see, God promised this. He said, I'll keep you along the way. I'll bring you to the place that I prepared. But there's precepts that he gives to Israel. He says, keep watch of yourselves before him. Before who? This angel of the Lord who would go with you. Keep watch of yourself. Have an honest view of your own heart. Make sure that you stand in purity before him. Keep watch over yourself. Instead of looking too much outward, look a bit inward. Judge for yourself, therefore, if you're with the Lord, if you're standing with the Lord. Keep watch over yourself. Recognize that you're frail. Recognize that you're able to fall. Recognize that you need to remain faithful to Him. And then he says, listen to His voice. Now you remember, don't you, another time where, well, there were two times where the voice came from heaven during Jesus' ministry. Once when He was baptized. This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. The other time at the Mount of Transfiguration. And what does the voice from heaven say about Jesus, His Son? This is my Son. Listen to Him. The same command is given to us as New Testament saints, as what it was to Israel. Listen to Him. Listen to His voice. The problem is not that God does not speak. The problem is that we don't want to listen to Him. God speaks. We have a God who communicates. A God who does not remain silent. The problem is that we like the earwax of our love of the world. And so we shut God off. We don't want to listen to Him. We want to go our own way. Listen to His voice. Then it says, do not be rebellious against Him. See, it's one thing to not listen to His voice. It's another thing to actually hear His voice and then choose to ignore it and go the other way. Do not be rebellious towards Him. Well, what is the if in our section? If Israel disobeyed, what would happen? This angel of the Lord would not pardon your transgressions. Now, who can pardon the transgressions of men? Only God can. And He says, because my name is in Him. That's why it's the angel of Yahweh. The angel of Yahweh. My name is in Him. The reason that He is able to forgive and pardon your transgressions is because He is me. I am Him. He has the authority of me, God. And if you rebel, you don't listen to His voice, and you go your own way, He's not going to forgive your transgressions. He was angry with this generation as they perished in the wilderness because they would not listen to His voice, because they did not keep watch over themselves, because they were rebellious. Soon after this, we're going to get there in Exodus, Lord willing, if the rapture doesn't happen soon, which maybe it will. And maybe you won't get to hear that sermon, because maybe the Lord calls you home by that time. Are you ready to meet Him? But we're going to get there where we see how Moses is up the mountain a little bit too long, and guess what Israel does? Bring all your jewelry. Bring all your gold. Come, let's melt it together and let's make a golden calf. And you bow down to that golden calf and you say, there's our God who took us out of Egypt. The hearts of Israel were not willing to keep a watch on themselves. They did not want to listen to His voice. And they rebelled against Him. And that whole generation would perish in the wilderness. If Israel disobeyed, he would not pardon their sin. There's a condition even of obedience. It says that if you truly listen to his voice, if you truly listen to his voice, there's this if. If you do all that I speak, you're to be my people. I'm to be your God. If you truly do this, if you truly will do what I say, 
then there's a blessing for obedience, and you see that following. Then I will be an enemy to your enemies. Somebody makes you their enemy, I'm going to be their enemy. Somebody makes themselves your adversary, now adversary is a similar word to enemy. I think it carries a little bit of a, a lighter tone than an enemy. An adversary is an opponent, it is a challenger, it is an accuser, it is a rival. He says, I will be an adversary to your adversaries. They come to accuse you, I will stand in accusation of them. I'll be your God. You'll be my people. Well, why is this conditional blessing given? Verse 23 is the summary statement. It says, for my angel will go before you and I will bring you in. I have this land of promise. And it's to the land of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now you realize why you don't like termites on your property. And he says, I will annihilate them. This is his promise to a people that are called to be his people, to worship him, to listen to his voice, to follow where he sends, to do what he says. Has Israel experienced this in all the fullness of current history? Have they ever fully experienced this? Now, you know your history. No. They haven't. They've had seasons where they've enjoyed some of this. They've had some of this. They've had some of their land. They've had some of the victories. But it's been an up and down thing all along. Two steps forward, five steps back. Five steps forward, three steps back. This is the history of Israel. Because they would not remain steadfast to their Lord. Have they ever received the full portion of the land? We're going to touch on the land in a moment a bit more. Never. Because they never wholly obeyed their God. What we see in a passage like this will be, however, fulfilled in Christ, in the millennial reign of Christ. It will be. Israel at the moment serves as an illustration, a very vivid illustration to you and to me of who God is, what He deserves, and the kindness and the loving goodness of God that He would not absolutely annihilate His people because they weren't committed to Him. He would annihilate their enemies. But the fact that God would not annihilate stubborn Israel even today is all His grace. And the fact that He would do this is all to His glory. But what about you and me today? Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as Israel did. Do not be stubborn and stiff-necked like the people of Israel. He has a perfect will for your life, but much of what you're experiencing is his permissive will in your life, much like Israel. Much like Israel. We're going to touch on God's, you want to know what God's will is? You can come tonight. There's an advert for this is the will of God for you, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Many of us, like Israel, do exactly the same thing as Israel does. We hear God's voice, but then we choose to go our own way. Let's look at the second section. Based upon verse 22, 23, and that assumed fulfillment, we find verse 24 to 28. And that's when this can really be started. This assumed, you're going to do this, so therefore verse 24 to 28 is going to happen. And that's a theocratical, and this section you could title theocratical commitments. Theocratical commitments, and it goes two ways. There's a commitment from Yahweh's people to God, but there's also a commitment from Yahweh to the people of God. And so you see from verse 24 to 28, let's look at that section. You shall not worship their gods, you shall not serve them, and you shall not do according to their deeds. But you shall utterly pull them down and shatter their sacred pillars in, in pieces. But you shall serve Yahweh your God, and He will bless your bread and your water, and I will remove sickness from your midst. 
There shall be no one miscarrying or barren in the land. I will fulfill the number of your days. I will send my terror ahead of you and throw into confusion all the people among whom you come. And I will make all your enemies turn their backs on you or to you. And I will send hornets ahead of you so that they will drive out the Hivites, the Canaanites, and the Hittites before you. Well, let's look at this section a bit more. First, you see the commitment that Israel was called towards. That's the first little piece here. You shall not worship their gods, he says. You shall not serve them. You see, it's one thing to worship their God. It's another thing to serve, to actually obey what their gods say to you to do. And you shall not do according to their deeds. You're going to be a separate people. You're not going to do the things that they do. You're going to do the things that my people do. You're going to do what, what is holy, because I am holy. You're going to be separate from the nations of this world. Do not be conformed to what they would have you do. You're going to be conformed to what I called you to do. And then he says, you shall utterly pull down and shatter their sacred pillars in pieces. You'll not even have the mo a bit of respect for their high places for their idol worship, for their, their pillars that they have erected to their false gods. As I give you the land, you're going to cleanse it of this evil. You're going to revive this land even. I don't even want one high place standing when you, my people, go into this land. You shall serve Yahweh your God. The fact that you serve Yahweh your God means you're going to do the list of the things above. As you serve him, you obey him. You will follow what he says and do what he calls on you to do. And then we've got the commitment of Yahweh to Israel based upon this serving of Yahweh their God. And there's seven blessings really that we see there. He will bless your bread and water. You're going to have abundance to drink. You're going to have abundance to eat. I'm going to bless it. You need food and you need drink. I'm going to give you food and drink. I'm going to bless it. I'm going to make sure that you have enough water. Now, you need your water to grow the wheat so that you can make the bread, but you get the point. I'm going to look after you. I'm going to provide for you. I will remove sickness from your midst. I'll make sure that you're healthy enough to do the work that I've called you to do. I'll bless your bodies. I'll bless your health. I'll make sure that you can serve me well, as you're well. There shall be no one miscarrying or barren in your land. I'm going to bless your womb. I'm going to make you fruitful in the land. I'm going to multiply you in the land. That's one of the reasons that God even gave Eve to Adam, was to multiply and fill the land. That's part of God's purpose, even in marriage. Multiply. You're not going to miscarry. You're not going to be barren. You're going to be giving birth. You're going to be filling up the land. You're going to have a heritage. I'm going to fill your quiver with arrows. Around your table, you're going to have your children there. I will fulfill the number of your days. That's an interesting phrase. You see, Psalm 139 says, while we were knit together in our mother's womb, he'd already allotted the days that were prepared for us. And he says, you'll fulfill your days. What do we see even in that little statement? We see something of the perfect will of God and then versus the permissive will of God. It may be that they actually were meant to live far longer than what they did, but they don't fulfill their days because they are not committed to God. And that happens with this generation. We've talked on that. Only Joshua and Caleb of that whole adult generation get to go into the land. Why not the rest of the adults of that land? Because God did not fulfill the number of their days. They died early. They died younger than what they were meant to die because they would not commit themselves to the Lord. They thought that they could save their own life, but in the end, they lost it. They went their own way, and it led to destruction. He then says, I will send my terror ahead of you and throw into confusion all the people among whom you come. There was something of that when 
Israel actually came into Canaan 40 years later. You know that the people in the land still were talking about what God did to Egypt? Because that would mark the decline of the Egyptians. Imagine you had gone through as a country the ten plagues that, the, that Egypt had gone through. Not only that, the last plague being the worst of the ten, all of the firstborn in all of the land of Egypt die. But then, in stubbornness, Pharaoh assembles his army, at that time probably the greatest army in all the known world at that point, with chariots and horsemen, and he chases after Israel. And as they go into the Red Sea and God closes it up on them, they are absolutely annihilated. The people in Canaan, 40 years later, were still talking about what God, Yahweh, had done to Egypt. There was a level of this dread, but it wore off. Why? Because the people of Israel didn't serve Yahweh. And you have 400 of the years of the judges where the very people spoken about in our passage at different points during that time ruled over Israel. They were in slavery in their own land by the people that were in the land that were supposed to be driven out. You go read the book of Judges. They start worshipping the gods of the Hivites. And next thing, guess what? The Hivites rule over Israel. Oh, you want those gods? Well, then have the people that worship those gods as your lords. They start worshipping the gods of the Canaanites. And guess what happens? The Canaanites rule over the people of Israel. Fine, you want their gods? Have the Canaanites as your lords. How are they treating you, Israel? How's it going for you, Israel? You still want to go your own way? No, Lord, please, we repent. We want a judge to save us. They start worshipping the gods of the Philistines. They take away all the swords of Israel. Don't even give them an army anymore. You think today's a, a new thing when there's rules to try and take away weaponry. No, no, it's been there all along. They only have things like plowshares and they have to go to the Philistines to even sharpen them. They don't even have sharpening equipment in their land. You want their gods, Israel, will have those people rule over you. Seven blessings from Yahweh. He bless their bread, bless them, give them wellness in their bodies, not barren. You know, they'll fulfill their days, sending the terror so that they're in confusion. I'll make your enemies turn their back to you. And then he says even, I will send the hornet. Now maybe you can go and search the Old Testament. I don't see a place where the hornet went to these four groups of people. Interestingly enough, you actually see that he, he'll send them against, what does he say there? I'll send the hornet against them and drive out the Hivites, the Canaanites, the Hittites. I'm going to send this they're going to take out half of your enemies that you have in the land. I'll turn nature against them. As you go, you won't even have to fight these people. They won't want anything to do with the land anymore. Because that's how I will go with you, Israel. Instead, Israel would serve these nations' gods and these nations would rule over Israel for the period of the Judges. See the six enemies really spoken of, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. But of them, the Hittites, the Canaanites, Hivites, you won't even have to fight against them. The hornet will drive them out. What a promise. Let's look at this third section then from verse 29 to 33. And this is the providential responsibility. You could title that section from verse 29 to 33, providential responsibility. Part of what you see here is God's sovereignty in many respects and man's responsibility. But I've called it providential because God does something for Israel, which enables Israel even to be responsible before God and to do what God calls them to do. He says this from verse 29, I will not drive them out before you in a single year. So God even has a providential plan for how quickly Israel will drive them out as Israel obeys God. 
lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. You see God's providence in even caring about Israel progressing as they go. I will drive them out before you little by little until you become fruitful and take the land as an inheritance. As you experience my blessings to you as my people and as you obey my voice, I'm going to do this. I'm even giving you the exact plan. I'm telling you beforehand, before you even go in, how quickly this is going to happen. And I'm telling you why it's going to happen like it's going to happen. It's providential. And I will set your boundary from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines and from the wilderness to the river. For I will give the inhabitants of the land into your hand and you will drive them out. Do you notice just before in verse 29, I will not drive them out. And then verse now, here where we are in verse 31 towards the end, and you will drive them out before you. Verse 32, you shall cut no covenant with them or with their gods. They shall not live in your land, lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. You know, that picture of a trap that would catch an animal, a snare to you. We don't go and catch our food like that. I mean, we go to the aisle in Tikantai or Woolworths or Checkers or wherever you found a good special and it's all nicely wrapped up. But you know, they knew what a snare meant. It's going to be a trap. We have them in. So what do we see here? We see, firstly, God gradually driving out the people before them. He says, I will not drive them out before you in a single year. I mean, there he's talking about one year. He's saying, no, no, I'm not going to do this in one year. What happened in the time of the judges? 400 years because of Israel's disobedience. They could have had it in a few years. He says, I'm not going to do it in a single year. That means he's going to do anything from maybe the second or the third year. But it takes 400 years. Why? Because he had his divine will for them, his perfect will for them, but instead, they got his permissive will for them because they did not listen. I, don't, I won't do this in a single year, lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. It's one thing you drive those enemies out, but then nature turns against you in the sense that the beasts are, because you see the beasts are actually doing what God had commanded them to do when he first made them. Do you know that? That's why you spade your cat. Because they obey God. God told them, be fruitful and multiply. And they do what God told them to do. All of nature still obeys, though they've been subjected to the brokenness of the sin curse and they groan for the day of redemption. That's why you sometimes get upset with the noises that your cat makes. Because they're groaning with the rest of creation for the day of redemption, Romans 8. But they do what God told them to do. The beasts do what God tells them to do. And therefore God makes a provision for the fact that the beasts do what he tells them to do. And he says, I'll drive out these enemies a little bit slower so that the beasts don't become too much for you. Because I care that much for you, Israel. I care for you so much. I don't want the beasts to get out of control. They're going to keep on obeying me. <laughs> Will Israel obey then we see a progressive driving out. I will drive them out before you little by little until you become fruitful and take the land as an inheritance. The land's yours, Israel. I've promised it to you. It's your inheritance. Has Israel ever owned the full extent of the land? Never. He says this, I will set your boundaries, and this is where we get to see some of where God told his people that he would have the land. And it's probably at least 10 times bigger than what Israel even owns today. I mean, today they own a piece that's almost the size of the Kruger Park. They should be owning a much larger piece that God had promised Israel. And they only received that in 1948. And they received even a smaller piece from the UN because thank you global elites for the land that you've given us. And then they took a little bit extra because they were attacked. You can go and read some of the history. And God gave them a marvelous victory. They used some World War I guns to protect themselves against all of the Arab nations around them that attacked them from seven sides, dry, wanting to drive them into the sea. And God miraculously keeps Israel there. 
and Israel's now in its land, and we can look at news things about their Iron Dome and how Hamas is attacking them, and Iran sending some things, and you've got Boko Haram and all the rest of these terrorist groups that still want to destroy Israel, and God still looks after Israel. But yet, they're still stubborn towards Him, still have hard hearts towards Him, still will not listen to Him, and still have not received their land. I will set your boundaries from the Red Sea. That's all the way down just before Egypt. You could say from the river of Egypt even, other passages will use. It's all the way down, down at the bottom of the Sinai Peninsula. He's saying, I'm going to set your boundary from here. I'm going to take your boundary to the Sea of the Philistines. That's the Aegean Sea that's on the western side of Israel. He's saying, I'm going to give you all of that land. You're going to own the whole coastline of the west. You're going to own the south you're going to own the west, you're going to have the south all the way to the Red Sea, which I just took you out of. Israel would have known about this. They, they've just crossed the Red Sea. And I believe that not what uh, they, they called her Saint Catherine, who was the mother of Constantine, that said that, this, uh, that Sinai was uh, to the left of the, the piece that goes up Gulf of Aqaba, and they actually went across into what we call Saudi Arabia today. You're going to have this from the south point, this west point, all of this land, to that western end of Canaan, all the way up past what's today known as Lebanon, from the wilderness. Now, there's a whole wilderness area on the right. That's why there was a section called the King's Highway that would go through Israel, because if you went too far to the east, you'd land up in the wilderness and there wasn't much water. So he's saying from this wilderness, this would be the boundary, this desert land, which today we would see as, as Arab nations. You're going to have this all the way up to the river. What river? It's talking about the river, which to them would have already been known as the Euphrates River. That's all the way up. That's a huge piece of land. That's much of even Saudi Arabia's land, Lebanon's land. Some of the very enemies that are still attacking Israel today, it's that land belongs to Israel. And yet they've never fully owned it. You go back to the promise that God gives to Abraham in Genesis 15 verse 18. God promises Abraham this same land. He says, on that day Yahweh cut a covenant with Abraham saying, to your seed I have given this land. It's given to them but have they ever owned it? No. His permissive will, because they disobeyed. They would not follow. From the river of Egypt, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. That's a huge piece of land. You can go look at it in that like 67th book in your Bible called Maps, there at the end. And you can see how huge the land is that God promised. And he says, for I will give the inhabitants of the land into your hand. But instead, most of Israel's history, we can see Israel given into the hands of those that are in these areas. And even today, people in some of these areas, that actually is the land that God promised Israel are shooting rockets at Israel. We have a live parable Today, you and I, of God's permissive will. But there's a responsibility that God calls Israel towards. And you will drive them out before you. God's saying, I'll drive them out. You drive them out. None of this fatalism nonsense where you go, oh, well, God let this happen, so I just sit back and do nothing. No, God says, you're going to be obedient. You're going to be part of the way that I drive the people out will be you driving them out because I go with you. You shall not cut a covenant with them or with their gods. You will not enter into an arrangement with them. You're my people. You have a covenant with me and I have a covenant with you. I've promised you and you're to promise me. You're to be married to me. Israel, you're to be my wife. I'm to be your husband. Don't you go and commit adultery with their idols. 
They shall not live in your land, God says. And why does he say this? Well, lest they make you sin against me. God knows the influence of idol worshippers. He knows the influence of people that do not bow down to him. Lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. You'll be trapped up. You'll be stuck. You'll never progress. You'll never do what I actually commanded you to do. You'll be trapped in a snare. Now as New Testament saints, and we've just considered all of the above, what do we say? Well, the battle indeed does belong to the Lord. Of course, our fight is not a fleshly, physical one. We are commanded to possess we, or rather, we are not commanded to possess a land like Israel was commanded to do, but we have been commanded to be an, a heavenly people, a citizenry that actually goes out and heralds the coming of the king. We commit ourselves to the promises of God. Our fight is not against flesh and blood. Our fight is not a carnal one, but a spiritual one. He's given us promises, and we hold to his promises. And he does. He promises even his presence with us. He promises His protection towards us. He promises His provision for us in Christ as we, His disciples, engage in a divinely given mission. As New Testament saints, we've been promised that God will be with us. We've been told many of the same things that Israel was, and we have them as a live parable. We're able to say, like Israel, well, much of what I'm facing in my life is probably even part of His permissive will. Because there's times I've not obeyed him like I should have. And yet he's been faithful to his promises even when I have been faithless. We experience what Israel experiences. Can this presence of God, protection of God, provision of God be ours today? Yes, it can. If indeed you and I will do what God called us to do, if we will be ambassadors for Him, if we will be His heralds in this world, if we will take part in what we were given as a mission as His disciples. The promised presence, protection, provision given to us. Why does it seem then that so many professing Christians are despondent, are down, are depressed, are disrespected, are deluded, are distracted. Is it possible, dear ones, and I want you to think through this with me, is it possible that we've become too much like Israel? Is it possible that we've become too complacent that we've become lukewarm in our commitments? Is it possible that we're reaping some of what we've been sowing, that we're under the permissive will of God, rejecting the perfect will of God set forth for us in Christ? Is it possible, dear one, that you need to be shaken to your core in repentance towards your God? Is it possible that we have adopted what is called neo-evangelicalism, where we have mixed our things up with the world. We have become like the world, thinking that that's what God wants of us. That the best Christians are the sheep that put on goat's fur. And we've got to wear that goat's fur around so that we don't offend the goats. Because that's the best way. And then you find out you can't take the goat's fur off because you're actually a goat and not a sheep at all. And you've pretended to have Jesus as your Lord, but you go your own way. Is it possible, dear one, that we are not fulfilling what God's perfect will is for Benoni Bible Church? It's lamentable. You read of men like Charles Spurgeon walking with one of his deacons, and the deacon says to Charles Spurgeon, we need, pastor, we need to repent, we need to weep, we need to, we need to mourn, we need to fast because we've only had 14 souls saved this week. What are we doing wrong? We've only had 14 people saved. 
God's not happy with us. We celebrate when we've had about six baptisms in three months. Wow. Must be a revival. Six baptisms. Is it possible, dear ones, that we become too much like Israel? Giving in to trials, temptations, and trinklets of the world. We've been wooed and awed by their shininess, by their sparkliness. But it's all candy floss, sugar in the air. How too many Christians just complain, criticize, excuse themselves, collude with other detractors, contrive a, a different way, convince themselves of the commendability of cowardice in this world. That must be Christian. Create a different Christ in their mind. A Christ who's happy with half-heartedness. A Christ that commends cowardice. A Christ that is not Lord. Yet they call him Lord, Lord. A Christ that wants them comfortable. Wants their ears tickled. And they're angry if they don't get that. Is it then any wonder that we see many fruitless professing Christians? So many who lack assurance. Am I saved? Am I not saved? Am I saved? For whether or not they are actually saved at all, only the Lord knows. They don't. They're too busy with sinning. They're too distracted with the things of this world. They will avoid persecution at all costs, thinking that somehow that would earn themselves the pleasure of God. Yet he says anyone who seeks to live a godly life will be persecuted. There's a chasing after the wind that many are doing. I hope it's not you, dear one, that you're not chasing after the wind because then you should not be surprised when you reap the whirlwind. Those who are sowing to the flesh should not be caught off guard when they begin to reap corruption. We have God's Word. We have what God has told us. We have the if-thens of devotion. What the Scripture says about some of these people and such people is this, 2 Timothy 3, 1-11, where he says, But know this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. Why will the difficult times come in the last days? For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips. You see, instead of proclaiming the glories of him who saved you from darkness to light, instead you'll be a malicious gossip if you're such a one. Without self-control, you can't hold yourself back. You give in to yourself. Without gentleness, without love for good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Narcissism, hedonism, materialism. Holding to a form of godliness. Oh no, I'm a Christian but having denied its power. Having denied its power. No, no, I'm godly. No. But I just please myself. I just do what I want. I just glorify myself. I just get what's mine in this world. No, but, but I'm godly. Godly. You deny his power. What does the scripture say to us? Keep away from such men as these. For among them are those who enter into households and take captive weak women weighed down with sins, being led on by various desires, always learning and never able to come to the full knowledge of the truth. 
In a similar way, as God said, I don't want those enemies in your land lest they make you sin. He's saying the same thing to the church. You should avoid such ones as this. Being led by various desires, always learning and never able to come to a full knowledge of the truth. I I pray, dear church, that that would not be said about you and I or about Benoni Bible Church. You guys are always learning, but you never get the truth. I pray that that would not be true. It says this, and it goes back to Exodus, or actually Numbers. Just as Janus and Jombres obeyed, uh, oppressed, oh, sorry, opposed Moses, so these men also oppose the truth. Men of depraved mind, disqualified in regard to the faith. People that do this oppose even today, what God does in His church. But they will not make further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all, just as theirs was also. But you, follow my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and suffering, such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. And out of them all, the Lord rescued me. You see, Paul did not deny the power of God. Paul went God's perfect will's way. See, Church of the Living God, we have the covering propitiation blood of Christ. We have what He did for us at the cross. We have the righteousness of Christ which is imputed to us And we had our sin-stained garments, the wrath that we deserved, imputed to Christ at the cross. And now, if indeed you are part of the church of Christ, you have a commission. You have been given a perfect will of God for you today at Benoni Bible Church. A commission which our Lord never ever recanted from. A commission which He gave to His people until the fullness of the Gentiles is brought in. A commission which you and I are to be committed to. And if indeed He is your Lord, and I pray this morning that He is your Lord, then we have promised presence of our Lord. We have protection given by our Lord. We have provision provided for by our Lord as we are committed to the commission of our mission. We need to wake up to this. We need to allow the Spirit of God to shake us to the core so that we wake up to this. He's promised us this. Look at Matthew 18, verse, oh, sorry, Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority. Some authority? Little bit? Not in the 21st century, surely. No, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, this verb in the, in the Greek is uh, in your going, in your daily doings. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. Some of the nations? All the nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to keep all that I commanded you. And behold, what is the promise? What is the if then of devotion? And behold, I am with you always. Some of the time. Not when there's a national emergency, surely. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. There's an end that is coming, dear church. You need to be committed to this promise. Or to this commandment, and he gives you his promise. Know for certain that any supposed authority that would stand against the above is no authority from Jesus. It's demonic. It's of the evil one. Any form of authority that would try to tell you something different than the mission that Jesus gave you as a church, you must see it for what it is. There is no such thing as being able to turn our commitment on or turn our commitment off to 
the Lord Jesus. We serve him as his people. Jesus never gives contradicting commands. He never one moment says, be courageous, and then the next says, well, there's certain times you can just be a coward. He calls on us in our will to shine brightly for him, to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into marvelous light. And that brings about persecution for you and for me, and so much a persecution that eventually some of the persecutors even start to ask you, what about this hope that's in you? Because it seems like you're actually holding on to something that's not quite here. And you're able to say, let me give you a defense of that hope. You see, I trusted in Jesus. He saved me. He bought me with his blood. I no longer belong to myself. I go where my Lord sends me. What keeps us from becoming like those spoken of in 2 Timothy 3 that we read a bit earlier? And you might have your Bible still open at 2 Timothy 3. These the difficult time that is coming where people will be lovers of self, etc. What keeps us? Well, it's the passage that just comes after 2 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy 3, verse 12 to 17. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Sometimes the absence of persecution in your life is because you don't actually desire to live godly. Think about that for a little moment. Sometimes, most of the time maybe even, some of the absence of persecution in your life is because you do not desire to be godly and live godly. You have a whole bunch of other desires. Because those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And then he says, but evil men and imposters. You know that we still have that today? Some of what holds a place like Benoni Bible Church back is at times imposters. People that actually are not of us. Eventually, they go from us, First John says. Imposters, while evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. No, no, there's a different way that you can be a follower of Jesus. How dare you say I'm not a follower of Jesus when I have no self-control? Deceivers, being deceived, deceiving others. But you, and he says this to Timothy, continue, and this is to you, you and I, continue in the things that you learned and became convinced of, knowing from whom you learned them, and that from childhood you have, been no, you have known the sacred writings which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be equipped, having been thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's what keeps us from being that first part in first Timothy, 2 Timothy 3. Dear ones, you're outsiders to this world, but insiders to God's redemptive plan in history. Isn't that a, doesn't that give you courage? You're in with Christ. You're out with the world. You're going to be out. You're going to fit out, not fit in with this world. But if you're fitting in with this world and you're battling to fit in with those that are in Christ, there's a problem. Know for certain that if you will listen to His voice, the reality of your separation from this world will become even more evident and it will provide you with glorious assurance of the presence of Christ for he goes with you. I pray that God would help us. Look again at Matthew 28. Verse 16 this time to verse 20. But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Isn't that quite a statement, just before the Great Commission? 
And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to keep all that I commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Even here this morning, we've been worshiping the Lord. Did you really read some of those words that we sang? Have you really been listening to some of the things that have been preached? We worship in Jesus. Is it possible, though, that there are some here this morning doubting? Not willing to really obey. Not willing to really listen. Who have not yielded themselves fully to their Lord. And you know if I'm speaking about you this morning. Because the Holy Spirit's putting his finger How do I know, as your pastor, that many, even today, are doubting? How do I know? Because we should see massive multiplication of disciples if we were not doubting. We should see many souls coming into the fold if we are not doubting. We should be seeing disciples made of every nation if we are not doubting. We should have baptisms every Sunday as we are disciples who are making disciples because we committed to what our Lord told us to do. We should see a passionate teaching ministry among the disciples who are disciple makers, committed to telling new disciples all of the marvelous things which Christ has told to you. All the things that he has commanded his disciples, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. And behold, we should know the very real presence of Christ our Lord with us. May the Lord rebuke those that need rebuking and encourage those that need encouraging. He is fully worthy of your trust. He's fully worthy of you going to him and saying, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Send, Lord, your servant will go. As long as you go with me, Lord, I'll go. I think we're in a time where we need to be called to repentance in our day. The church is increasing like that in places like Saudi Arabia, in places like China. You know that China has now a huge group of evangelicals as they face persecution because they seek to live godly lives. In places like Nigeria, which is now the third greatest group of evangelicals in our world, where they are being persecuted by Muslims because they seek to live godly lives, we need to return to our Lord. We need to worship our Lord. We need to stop doubting. We need to take him at his word. The Lord said it. It's enough for me. By the mercies of God, present yourself as a sacrifice. You should be smoking for the glory of God. I said that loudly so that you would get the irony, but not that smoking. People should look at you and see the smoke rise. Living holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may approve what? What the will of God is. What the will of God is. That which is good and pleasing and perfect. There's a perfect will of God that is pleasing to him and it is good but many of you are stuck in a permissive will because you won't take him at his word. That's Romans 12, 1 to 2. Too many have been too conformed to this world. You live no different than them. Your passions are no different than theirs. Your concerns are no different from theirs. Your entertainment is no different from theirs. You have adopted a hypocritical moralism and you called that Christian. And I'm afraid that that's not Christian at all. 
And it may be that you actually get greeted one day instead of being exonerated where you will be excommunicated from the glories of heaven. There's too many that go there and they say, Lord, Lord, we did those things in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We healed the sick in your name. We did many mighty works in your name. And he says to them, get away from me. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. You workers of lawlessness. Because I told you to go and make disciples, but all you've been busy with is all of these other things that you want to puff yourself up with. Instead of living to my glory, you live to your own. Instead of living to my pleasure, you live to your own. Instead of giving me all of you and all of your stuff used to my glory, you've done it for yourself. You lived your so-called Christian life saying, puff me, please me, pay me. This is serious, church. And it calls us towards seriously looking at our hearts. We have the parable of Israel before us who still have not received the blessing promised to them in Exodus 23. And then there's the hope. They will one day because of the finished work of Christ at the cross. And he has the hope for you and me because we're pretty frail, aren't we? God is faithful. That even in the midst of his allowed will, his permissive will, that he will receive all of the glory. Isn't that glorious? That despite all of your frailty, all of your weakness, all of the conviction that you felt, even as I've been preaching to you this morning, that Jesus has done it. That Jesus has conquered. That Jesus is victorious when he said it is finished. That Jesus perfectly obeyed his Father. That he humbled himself, even to the point of death on a cross. And that you, dear one, can be set free because of his finished work. Maybe you're in a dungeon that you've made for yourself, but the doors open wide. And you're sitting in the corner and you're not doing what God called you to do. Well, then grab hold of Jesus this morning, because he's done it all for you. He's done it all for you. And when he looks at you one day, when you stand before him and he says, why should I let you in? And you say, because it says paid for in full by Jesus' blood. And that really frees you up, doesn't it? Because what will separate you from the love of God? What's holding you back? Go before the Lord even this morning. Be honest with him because he already knows. What's making your soul anxious? What's causing you to not obey? What's making you to doubt what Jesus has said, what Jesus has promised? What's keeping you from obeying? Go to him this morning. There's no other way. The sheep of Christ's fold, hear his voice. He knows them and they follow him. Humble yourself before the Lord. Stop trusting your own way. God provided a perfect way for you. You see, church, when we embrace that, that's real freedom, isn't it? That's real freedom. And then that frees you 